So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for introducing yourselves in the chat and filling out the fun poll questions. My name is Brennison Wheeler. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Community Education and Outreach Manager at Women's Advocates, which is a nonprofit organization in St. Paul, Minnesota, that offers a continuum of safety through our prevention programming through events like these, emergency shelter, and aftercare housing support services for victim survivors of domestic violence. And so I'm going to just give everyone just a few more, maybe one more minute to fill out the poll, including the questions, what do you hope to gain from this event? Um, a fun one about if age is only a state of mind, which category best describes your state of mind right now? And if your city were a breed of dog, which breed would it be? And so I'll go ahead and end those here and share the results. Seems like people are still contributing. So let's just give it one more, one more quick sip. Okay, go ahead and share those. So a lot of people responded that they are looking for more information about minor, minority mental health and also information on how they can support marginalized communities with education and research. So thank you again for being here. For people's state of mind, we have a majority identifying with mad mid lifer. So that is definitely relatable. Um, and it is Friday, so maybe there's opportunities to move into these different ages of state of mind. And then for your city, a lot of people describe theirs as pit bull, terrier, scary, but kind deep down. <laughs> so very fun, very interesting. Thank you for contributing to that. Um, it is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, which it's also being referred to as BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month. BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. And so, oops, well, that, that makes sense. <laughs> so you can go to this site if you're looking to learn more. A lot of you said that you're really interested in knowing how to support, um, you know, BIPOC individuals. And so, there is a theme and they have a whole toolkit on their website about these three different components of community care, self-directed care, and cultural care. So if you're interested in that, totally recommend that you check it out. Okay, so getting into this panel. So this is kind of going to be the uh, projection of the next 90 minutes that we have together. So we'll meet our lovely panelists. We'll be able to have more context about each of these different themes, which you'll see below. We'll have three that we'll focus on with discussion questions, and then also a poll question for all of you at the beginning as well. And then we'll have additional opportunities for more Q and A's that might come up later on, and then some resources to share at the very end. And then I did want to provide a few quick reminders. So the webinar is being recorded. The live transcription should be on. And if the subtitles at the bottom are distracting or for any reason you don't want them on, you can hit the button uh, live transcription and click another button that will say hide subtitles. So that is always an option. And then also wanted to thank both of our wonderful ASL interpreters, Coco and Stephanie, for being here and providing um, ASL interpretation for this event. It is a webinar, so just want to assure everyone that as an attendee, your camera and your microphone are both automatically turned off, so we usually get a lot of questions about that, so I just wanted to ease some of your minds now. And then we also wanted to emphasize and be explicit about this panel having a focus on Asian American experiences, which is largely due to the expertise and experience of the panelists themselves. Um, and then along with that, that uh, the panelists are never generalizing their opinions to represent an entire group of people, right? So you're getting um, their unique experiences and knowledge. And so make sure that you know that this is coming from Claire, this is coming from JE. So um, kind of keep that in mind. 
It's also a panel, so we would love for you to send in questions uh, using the Q&A feature would probably be the best way for us to be able to keep track of those questions. So feel free to send them anytime during the panel. You don't have to wait until the end. And so we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. And you will be emailed a link to the recording if you need to go early or you want to send it to anyone, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint slides and instructions on how to request and receive a certificate of attendance. Anything that you, um, Claire and Jay, you want to add to this list of reminders today? OK, great. So now we'll meet the panelists and also learn a little bit more about why they feel that minority mental health wellness is an important topic to discuss and anything along with that. So we'll start with Jay. Hi, my name is J.E. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, so I'm a fourth year PhD student in counseling psychology in the same program as Claire. Um, so I went to undergrad at Brown University and I majored in psychology and history. Um, and my main research interests are around intergenerational trauma in Asian American immigrant and migrant families um, and the well-being of queer and trans people of color. Um, I also love cats. I have two cats and outside of school, I like baking and cooking and arts and crafts. Um, recently, I've also been doing a lot of crocheting. So, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and I guess I'll pass it to Claire. Yeah, hello everyone. Happy to be here today. Um, so my name is Claire and I am a fifth year PhD student in counseling psychology. And um, both Jay and I are at the University of Minnesota. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I also did my undergraduate education at the University of Minnesota. And I grew up in Minnesota. So I am Minnesotan at least since I was seven. So yeah, in terms of my research interests, I am really interested in um, transitional periods in a person's life. So things like um, puberty, um, the transition to college, young adulthood, emerging adulthood, um, and um, seeing how ethnic and racial minorities deal with that transition um, is something that I'm passionate about. And I'm also interested in intergroup relations as well. So yeah, that's kind of who I am. Uh, my pronouns, I think I said, are she and her. And I identify as Asian American and more specifically, um, Korean American. So. Great, thank you both so much. And I could have missed it, but do either of you wanna expand on that question about why minority mental health wellness is important to you or do you wanna kind of just get to it later? Um, sure, oh, Claire, go ahead. Sure, I can start and then Jay, you can go ahead as well. Yeah, I think one um, reason why I think this discussion is so important is I'm so happy to see that mental health awareness is really um, increasing in our world and in our society. But I think it's really important to note that it's not moving at the same pace for everyone. And so, um, especially for um, ethnic and racial minorities, as well as sexual minorities, I think it's really important to remember that um, we need to keep having that conversation so that people's voices are heard and so that you know, as practitioners and clinicians and teachers and as friends as well and parents, um, we can really support, um, yeah, that sort of more discussion of um, mental health awareness for all people, so. Hmm. Yeah, I think similarly to Claire, obviously we both feel very passionately about this topic because we decided to come to grad school <laughs> to study it. Um, yeah, so I identify as Asian American, specifically Chinese American and queer and trans. And so, um, and I think as someone who's been like um, involved, you know, in sort of like political advocacy stuff, um, I think the issue of mental health has come up a lot. And for um, a lot of reasons that we're going to sort of get into in the presentation, I think people of color face a lot of barriers. Um, other minority groups also face a lot of barriers to accessing appropriate support from professionals as well as, you know, like their own communities. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really great that we're having this conversation today. Wonderful, thank you both. 
So now we want to hear from you all, the attendees. We, you know, part of the title of this webinar is Identity Matters. And so your identities matter to us as well. So we would love to hear from you. And we do have um, a little word cloud that we'll all create together. It's something that we often do during these webinars. So you have a few options for how to contribute. So you can click on the link that I just sent in the chat. Or you can, if you have a phone or something with a camera nearby, you can point to the camera at this QR code and then the link will pop up at the top and you can click on it and add up to 10 different identities. It can be social identities, so your gender, your race, your sexual orientation, your ability, socioeconomic status, education level, religious affiliation. It could also be your profession. It could also be a, fam a familial role, a community role, or anything else that makes you unique or you. So we'd love to see those contributions to the word cloud. I'm being told it's hard to hear me. Is this better if I move this closer? Okay, thank you for letting me know. I might have another, um, another headset. I'll look for that while you all are filling out the word cloud. So I'll share the screen of that as that is populating. Can you all see the word cloud start to build here? Great. So one cool thing about mentee is that as a word is entered more frequently, the size of the word increases as well. So some of the bigger words that we see here are advocate, woman, friend, daughter, mother, social worker. We also see um, some other identities such as survivor, Latinx, church youth leader, activist, um, a listener, sexual assault advocate, Hmong, Mexicana, um, Afro-Indigenous, a therapist trainee, first generation, a community leader, an elder, bisexual, queer, low income, disabled, emotionally intelligent. Yeah, a lot of things that are important to how people make sense of themselves. And so I really appreciate you all contributing this, to this. And I think it's important for us to think about our own identities and our own roles in the community as well as we are having this conversation. But it's really great to see a wide array of different individuals on this call. So feel free to send any comments or any contributions or your thoughts in the chat too, because we'd love to hear your perspective and thoughts as well. So feel free to continue to contribute to this word cloud as you would like. I'm gonna go ahead and continue with the, uh, the slideshow. So here we are. Okay. So now we will be discussing the first theme, which is the need for mental health support as well as approaches for Asian Americans. So mental health support approaches. So we'll first start with a poll for all of you. And so the question is, do you know some of the barriers to mental health support for BIPOC individuals? So I'll give you two minutes to fill that, or maybe one minute. <laughs> to fill that out and then we'll dive into this topic a little bit more. I'm gonna try no headphones. 
and I'm projecting my voice. So hopefully that will be better. My apologies, everyone. Okay, and then we have 20 more seconds to fill out this poll. There's a comment in the chat that was sent to just panelists. So if you do want all panelists and attendees to see your message, just make sure you're clicking the button above the, my voice is still quiet, I'm, I apologize, above the text box to change to all panelists and attendees. And so someone in the chat said, I've heard from BIPOC friends that discussing mental health is taboo. Yeah, we can definitely discuss that a little bit more later too as that comes up. Headphones are better, we're gonna go back to that. So. Hello? Can you hear me? <laughs> ah, okay. So, for the poll results, it's looking like 47% of us could name a few of these barriers to mental health support, but mostly unfamiliar. So, and then there's a couple that are in some of those other categories too. So thank you for sharing that. You are also always welcome to expand um, on your responses in the chat. So I'll hand it over to Julie and Sarah to kind of take over this section. Sure, so to give kind of some basic background um, on Asian Americans as a racial group. So Asian Americans right now are the fastest growing racial group in the US in terms of population. Um, and the term Asian American includes East, Southeast and South Asians. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're incorporating all of those groups because often different, you know, when people think of Asian American, they only think of East Asians. Um, yeah, and so right now about 7% of the uh, popul American population is um, Asian American. Um, and as we can see in this graphic um, of these nearly 15% reported having a mental illness in the past year, which translates to about uh, 2.9 million people, which is a lot of people. So this is obviously an issue that's important to our communities. And um, in the in Minnesota, um, we can look at the breakdown of the Asian American population, um, which is in Minnesota, the population is kind of unique because the majority of Asian Americans are Southeast Asian with the largest group being Hmong Americans. Um, and this demographic distribution is because of the large resettlement of refugees from the US wars in Southeast Asia in Minnesota. Um, nationally, the largest Asian American groups are Chinese, Indian, and Filipino. Um, and each of these ethnic groups now has a population of over 4 million. Um, okay, there's a question from the audience. Do you include Middle Eastern in Asian? Um, I think that most people who um, identify as, you know, Middle Eastern or Arab American would consider that a different racial group. I think it's kind of confusing because race is, you know, socially constructed and defined. And so there isn't really like a straightforward way of saying like, yes, this definitely is this group or definitely this other group. And I think currently, um, or at least recently in the US census, um, people from, you know, what we would call the Middle East are considered white. Um, which obviously a lot of people would dispute um, and which, you know, highlighted by the treatment of a lot of, you know, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans after 9-11. Um, and so I think a lot of people are now advocating for including a different uh, racial categorization of Middle Eastern North African or Southwest Asian North African um, that is separate from Asian American. Although, of course, Asia, the continent of Asia includes Southwest Asia and Europe. So, you know, who's to say? <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of mental health care for people of color, um, people of color, including Asian Americans, are underserved in mental health care despite need for services. As um, we pointed out before, a lot of Asian Americans will have a psychiatric disorder in their lifetime. One study found 17. 0.3% percent 
of Asian Americans reported having some psychiatric disorder in their lifetime. Um, something that is pointed out sometimes is that Asian Americans overall have a lower suicide rate than the national average, um, but this sort of um, you know, sweeping statistic kind of hides some other trends. So suicide was the leading cause of death for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders between the ages of 15 to 24 in 2019. Um, Asian American college students have a higher rate of suicidal ideation, which means you know, thinking about um, wanting to commit suicide um, than their white peers. Asian American women, 15 to 24 years old, have the second highest rate of suicide after Native Americans. Um, and suicide rates for young Asian Americans reflect, you know, some particular stressors that they face. So Asian American high schoolers and college students may be particularly vulnerable to suicidality, uh, resulting from, you know, this huge pressure to perform well academically, to get into good colleges and secure good jobs, as well as, you know, the difficulties um, of talking with their parents about these struggles that they're experiencing. Um, and this pressure is compounded by the model minority myth or the stereotype that Asian Americans are all naturally intelligent and high achieving. So young Asian Americans may also carry a high pressure to succeed on behalf of their immigrant families, you know, that putting all their dreams in their children um, is kind of like, you know, the narrative. Um, in fact, in recent years, Palo Alto, California has seen rashes of suicide clusters among its teen population. And many of these cases have involved Asian Americans. Many Asian American students at elite colleges have also lost their lives to suicide. Um, and so despite you know, this need for services, Asian Americans are three times less likely than white counterparts to seek these services. So we're gonna talk a bit about why that might be. Um, so kind of getting to the poll question that Bernison had posed before, um, People of color face, you know, a lot of barriers to appropriate mental health care. Um, these include things like language, obviously, is particularly relevant to immigrant families um, and individuals whose first language is not English. Um, you know, obviously, most therapists in the U.S. provide services only in English. Um, there also can be a lack of familiarity with mental health issues and mental health care among, you know, communities of color. Um, concepts of mental health as we understand them in the U.S. today, excuse me, are based in ideas from, you know, white psychologists and psychiatrists uh, from the U.S. and Europe. Um, that's kind of the foundation of, you know, the sciences of psychology and psychiatry. And so communities of color, especially immigrant communities, may not have the same concepts of mental health. Um, and there might even be a perception that mental illness is like a quote unquote white thing or a quote unquote American thing. Because even as mental health issues have become more widely acknowledged, um, the narratives center on white people and our mental health care systems um, are mainly structured to serve white people as Claire was kind of alluding to before. Um, and so this also relates to the next barrier, which is that providers often lack cultural competence or familiarity with communities of color. And so cultural competence is, uh, means a clinician's ability to work with people of different cultural backgrounds which includes knowing about the issues that affect um, different communities and knowing that ident people's identities matter in mental health care. Um, this lack of cultural competence is a product, of course, of the sort of Eurocentric training that uh, mental health care providers usually get in the US, um, because again, psychology and psychiatry are sort of you know, white Eurocentric sciences. Uh, though as time goes on, more and more people are working to address these issues um, in psychology and psychiatry. Um, another related issue is just the lack of diversity among mental health care providers um, because of all the issues that I just mentioned. So in Minnesota, um, according to the Department of Health, 88% um, of psychologists are white, 88% of psychiatrists practicing in Minnesota are white, and 90% of social workers are white. So obviously this is gonna present a major challenge for um, people of color seeking services. And then um, Asian Americans um, and other people of color also face unique stressors that can affect their mental health. So an important part of cultural competence for mental health care providers is understanding these particular challenges and how they might affect their clients. 
So obviously a major stressor for Asian Americans as with all people of color is racism. So this includes microaggressions and everyday discrimination as well as overt violence, especially as we've seen um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, racism against Asian Americans often stems from a few major stereotypes of Asian Americans, including the model minority myth, which um, we just mentioned, um, the perpetual foreigner stereotype, um, which is the idea that all Asians are always foreigners and can never really be American, um, and yellow peril, which describes the ways that Asians are perceived as a threat to white people or to the U.S., and we can see this right now again in the racism directed at Asian Americans and the anti-China rhetoric related to COVID-19. Um, and the majority of Asian Americans are immigrants, which also poses unique challenges. So immigration itself is a stressful and sometimes traumatic process. It often means leaving behind everyone and everything that you know and um, being separated from family and other support networks, sometimes permanently. Um, immigrants have to go through a process of acculturation, which means culturally adapting to the new country. And it can be difficult for people to navigate um, sort of what elements of their new culture they want to adapt and what elements of their heritage culture that they want to keep and how they want to raise their children sort of in these um, different cultural contexts. And in particular, acculturation can create gaps in understanding between parents and children, as children acculturate just much faster than adults, you know, they're in school learning the culture and, you know, children are, you know, set up to, you know, absorb everything, you know, that's going on around them. And so they're going to be learning the new culture a lot faster than their parents. Um, this can lead not only to language gaps um, between parents and children, but also differences in cultural expectations between parents and children that can turn into conflict and stress for the whole family. We'll try these headphones. Is this better for people? Okay, hopefully that is the case. So we do have a few minutes here. Um, we might not get to all of these questions, but I'll allow Jay and Claire to kind of pick which ones feel most uh, relevant to the conversation that they want to expand on. So feel free to um, dive into your conversation. Yeah, I think Jay did a really good job of covering um, this really big topic that we're trying to condense into 90 minutes today. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to echo was um, Jay talked about the model minority myth. And um, I think oftentimes one misconception that providers, teachers, you know, all of us might have is that this is a positive thing um, and that this is something that um, encourages Asian American students or um, makes them feel good about themselves. And that's often the way that it's actually perpetrated. And so um, I think that's something that, you know, for question one, it says, what are some common misconceptions about mental health in the Asian American community? Um, I mean, there's many things that are wrong with the model minority myth, but um, I think one of the biggest issues is that it puts a lot of internalized pressure on people who are of Asian American descent. And the fact of the matter is that not everyone is going to be good at math or not everyone is going to have the same personality of being very submissive or obedient. And yet these are the sorts of myths that continue to be perpetrated. And they're the sorts of things that are praised when Asian American students are this way or um, that sort of thing. And so I think as um, mental health um, professionals and um, mental health providers, as well as just helpers and advocates in this community, that's one thing that we really need to be mindful of. Even as an Asian American myself, I think that's something that I check for myself is, um, do I think, you know, in this way, because of the model minority myth that has been fed to all of us for so long. And I think another important aspect of the model minority myth and how it hurts our community is it really, um, um, really minimizes the struggles of other BIPOC individuals. And so um, that's something that I just wanted to highlight and um, feel free to just comment in the chat below too. But yeah, I think that's something that is important to note. So.
Yeah, I think as sort of Claire was saying, I think one a main thing that individuals, you know, whether you're a service provider or just, you know, a person relating to other people is, you know, keeping in mind these kinds of dominant stereotypes and ideas. Um, because, you know, as Claire said, even if they seem positive and like good, they are still serving the purpose of, you know, limiting the ways that people could be. Um, and I think it is really important to, yeah, reflect on how, and like, you know, everybody absorbs them, you know, like even Asian Americans, you know, like part of the reason that the model minority myth, you know, has been linked to these suicides is because, you know, people have internalized them so much that they think, you know, like, if I can't be that, I'm a failure. Um, and so, you know, it's important for everyone, I think, to reflect on how, yeah, the ways that we think, the ways that we perceive ourselves and others are affected by these ideas. Yeah, I think um, question two is also interesting. How can social service providers help Asian clients navigate barriers to mental health support? Um, I think one of the most important things actually is to just be aware of the barriers. Um, first and foremost, um, oftentimes I think um, folks aren't as aware of these different barriers that might be in place. and. They might be like, why don't you just seek out help? Or why don't you just whatever? And I think that sort of attitude um, can be harmful for um, people who have all of these barriers to mental health support. And so um, I think being empathetic and compassionate in that way is one way that social service providers can really help Asian clients. And I think also contributing and engaging in discussions like this within our community of mental health care providers and learners and teachers, I think is really important because that's the only way that we're going to get more information about um, how these barriers are actually manifesting and how these barriers can be broken down. And so I think that's one way that social service providers can really help Asian clients, but actually any client of, you know, ethnic or rac racial minority descent is, to really do the work on your own first, um, to be able to notice those stereotypes and biases that we're talking about, to also recognize that there's a lot that we all need to learn. And so engaging in these sorts of conversations and discussions and asking questions, um, I think is one of the ways that even before you even see the client that you can do um, some of that work to support them. And then once you do see these clients and are actually able to have that opportunity to navigate barriers, I think one of the things that could be helpful is to just talk to them about what barriers they're facing and to be able to do that with a non-assuming attitude and to be really curious about where they're coming from and hear them out first. Because one thing that I um, really wanna make sure we get out of this is um, Asian Americans are not all the same, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, all of you probably know, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but, you know, with um, Asian Americans, there's so many different um, ethnicities. And of course, within those ethnicities and experiences, each person has their own individual personality and characteristics and whoever they are. And so I think always having that attitude of wanting to know more about where the client is coming from um, is really the first step to helping that helping them navigate any sort of barriers. And I think there was a, okay. Okay, yeah, there's a question in the chat, thoughts on model minority and glamorizing an individual based on their race and how that poses a barrier with mental health. Um, yeah, so I think as sort of Claire was pointing out, right, the model minority myth is sort of perceived as a positive stereotype, right, which people assume must be harmless. Um, but again, it sort of like flattens a person, right? Even, you know, for Asian Americans who are able to achieve those like model minority things, like, you know, going to Harvard, you know, getting a job in like at Google or as a doctor or like whatever, um, it flattens that person into sort of like a token, right? Like we talk about tokenization. And so, and like, I think that actually speaks to the sort of the history and purpose of the model minority myth, which is that it's really rooted in anti-Blackness, right? Like 
Asian Americans were cast as this model minority as a way to say like, well, Asians can do it. And so why can't black people or like, you know, other people, you know, why do they have to complain about racism? And like, why can't they, you know, like achieve and, you know, like, you know, be doctors and engineers and stuff like Asian. So like the model minority myth is a way to sort of say like racism doesn't exist because, you know, Asian Americans, you know, they pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They're smart. They, you know, they're family oriented. They value education, you know, all these things, which um, again, you know, are really, um, you know, treat Asian Americans as a monolith and, you know, really limits the way that people are allowed to be. Um, and also, you know, is used again, as Claire mentioned, against other people of color. Um, and so I think that really harms people, you know, in terms of if they think, you know, since I'm Asian, I can only be X, Y, and Z things, you know, that is really harmful to people. And it also is harmful to people who aren't Asian because again, it's used against them of like, oh, you're not doing enough, you know, you need to be better. And if you are, you know, facing oppression, that's your fault, right? Yeah, I think um, Jay just hit it on the nail, but you know, with the barrier to mental health, if you are somebody who fits that model minority stereotype, you know, our mental health is not static and it's not linear. And so sometimes there are difficulties in life where you might actually need some help. And, you know, if you've been the person who fits that stereotype and who's fit that model minority myth and have been kind of viewed as that model minority, um, I think you can all imagine how it must be harder for that person to actually say, I'm struggling, I need help, and I'm going to seek it out. That's a much bigger barrier that that person is going to have. And then for people who don't fit into that model minority stereotype, it's almost as if they're failing as an Asian American, right? And so there's a lot of stigma. And because this is an internalized stereotype, and this is an internalized myth, even within the Asian American community, there might be a lot of shaming and there might be a lot of um, guilt that they're not living up to what they're supposed to be living up to. And all of those things um, can on a very emotional and individual level pose that barrier to mental health. I think there was something else. Um, thoughts on service providers, social workers, advocates, therapists, et cetera, being the same race as their clients and this is more beneficial or if it's just based on client preference, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Yeah, Jay, yeah. do you wanna go ahead? Oh yeah, so there's been a, like a little bit of research on this, I think in terms of racial matching between therapists and clients. And I think the findings are kind of mixed um, in terms of like whether it helps or not. And I think that also kind of comes down to like people are not just their race, right? Like not all Asian providers are gonna interact with Asian clients in the same way. You know, not all black providers are gonna interact with black clients and all black clients in the same way, you know, cause all therapists are different, all clients are different. And yeah, and I think it is important to consider client preference because, you know, some people, you know, might not want a racial match in terms of their client or in terms of their therapist, you know, like I had a client, for example, who was kind of nervous about having a provider who was from her same ethnic community because she kind of had this fear of being judged, you know, by people from her, um, from her community. And so, yeah, I think it is kind of like where people are at. And I think that relates to this other question in the Q&A, um, how do you confront or approach people who would perpetuate these racism acts towards their own culture, specifically if they are in an interracial couple with a white individual? Yeah, I think this does highlight, like some people also just have internalized racism and that could be therapists and clients, right? That um, people can look at each other in the same way um, of like, you know, eight people in the Asian American community looking at other Asian Americans saying like, why aren't they, you know, getting, you know, 2,400 on their SAT, you know, they're not doing good enough. Um, because, you know, white supremacy, you know, it does affect all of us. And, you know, especially, you know, with related to the model minority myth, a lot of Asian Americans will see that as the way to make it in America, right? That's the path to success. And so it can become really important for people to adhere to that even, and because people don't really, you know, necessarily see, or like, it's not highlighted to them how that harms people. Claire, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I guess um, just to add to basically what you've already said is um, it really depends on the individual. Um, but I think for certain individuals, having their service provider be the same race um, and come from the same experiences makes it so that they don't have to 
explain as much. And of course, um, we're going to talk a little bit about cultural humility a little bit more later on. But I think it still goes to say, as Jay was saying, that um, whether or not you are the same race or ethnicity, um, if you are assuming the experiences that that person has had, that that client has had, and um, you believe that you know everything about that person because you are of the same race or ethnicity, then that's a big misstep. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in terms of why it might be helpful for ethnically marginalized clients, I think because there might not be as much things you have, you have to explain, it might also be that um, there's more of a shared understanding about how different things affect you because you are part of that same community. Um, so yeah, I think the research is, um, somewhat mixed, but um, there's another question coming in. It says, is it best to state up front to the client that you are aware of stereotypes and try to cognitively avoid attaching these associations? That's a really great question. Um, personally, as um, a psychologist in training, I find it very important to be transparent with my clients and that is in all areas. So if that means that I'm not really understanding where they're coming from or I have these stereotypes or biases, I think I really have to do a lot of extra work. So that means a lot of talking with my supervisor, a lot of self internal reflection on how these sorts of biases and stereotypes that I already hold are playing out in the therapy session and being able to do a lot more of that reflective work makes it possible for me to be upfront and transparent to the client without just saying things that might end up hurting them. And I can be a lot more intentional about what I'm sharing. But yeah, I, I don't think that it would hurt. Um, of course, like I said, based on the fact that you've already done some of this work for yourself, I think it would actually might be refreshing to some clients that, um, you are aware of these stereotypes and you're able to start a discussion with them about it. And as always, it needs to be a conversation and a discussion and from that attitude of curiosity rather than um, you know, teaching them about stereotypes or um, telling them that they should be that way and stuff like that. So yeah, that's a really great question. Absolutely. Thank you both for that. This has been such an enriching conversation. I think we'll be able to touch on the root of question three and the next theme. So we'll go ahead and kind of progress there, if that's okay with both of you, just to keep us on track. So our second theme is more specifically about the impact of trauma uh, for Asian Americans. And so we'll start with a uh, poll question it actually has to this time. And so the first question is, how familiar are you with the terms intergenerational and historical trauma? And what groups of people do you associate with the term intergenerational trauma? And so I'll give about 50 more seconds for that response, just to hear from all of you and where you're at. I'm already seeing a number of people selecting that four groups of people that they associate with the term intergenerational trauma. They're not on the poll. So I'd love to see what groups come to your mind in the chat if you would like to share that. Hmm, yes, yeah, Latinx, that community, that was a, 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 a misstep on my part. Um, and it, yes, it's only selecting one. Um, a lot of people want to select all of them, several. Some say that everyone experiences it, but some more than others. Yes. Yeah, that definitely should have been a multiple choice question instead of um, only one. So thank you for catching that. Lots of thoughts about this in the chat. So thank you for engaging in that. I'll go ahead and end the poll. 
So 33% of us say that we're somewhat familiar and then we have similar rates for familiar and very familiar as well too. So that will be helpful for JE as they go through this next section. Um, someone's also talking about this is where intersectionality comes into play. White folks definitely experience trauma, but it may not be racial trauma, maybe from refugee, immigrant status, poverty, etc. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. So we'll turn it over to JE for a larger discussion about intergenerational trauma. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, intergenerational trauma is one of my major research interests. Um, and intergenerational trauma um, is also sometimes called historical trauma. Um, and it refers to trauma that a community that shares a common social identity, um, like an ethnicity or religion or nationality, um, experiences together and then passes on to their descendants. So that's the intergenerational part. Um, and so research on intergenerational trauma really started with Holocaust survivors and their families looking at how the trauma that people experienced during the Holocaust affected their relationships with their children. Um, and since then, Native American researchers have also done a lot of work with their own communities examining the intergenerational impacts of genocide and um, colonization. Um, for Asian Americans, there is a smaller body of research that has been done on Southeast Asian refugee families. And there's also a small body of research on intergenerational trauma in Black families descended from people who were held in chattel slavery. Um, so yeah, as you all pointed out, a lot of different, you know, the idea of intergenerational trauma applies to like a lot of different groups. And that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about is kind of how can we expand this out to um, other groups that haven't really been represented in the research on this. So the research on um, intergenerational trauma for Southeast Asian communities has focused on refugees from the wars in Southeast Asia, um, particularly Cambodian refugees. And um, researchers have found that in these populations, um, there is a higher prevalence of PTSD and other mental health conditions stemming from pre-migration experiences. So for, you know, Cambodian refugees in particular, that would be the, um, the Khmer Rouge, the Cambodian genocide. Um, as we previously mentioned, many Southeast Asians came to the U.S. and specifically to Minnesota to escape the violence of U.S. bombings, um, wars, the Cambodian genocide, as well as the after effects of this violence. And once in the U.S., they received little support for coping with this trauma. And indeed their traumatic experiences are often unrecognized in the US. So for example, when people talk about the trauma of the Vietnam War in the US, they're usually talking about white American veterans and not the experiences of Vietnamese refugees and other Southeast Asian refugees um, from related conflicts. Um, but this trauma is a big part of Asian American life because of its effects on Asian American mental health and Asian American families. Um, many Asian immigrant families um, or, you know, refugee parents might try to just sort of move on and forget the past, um, especially since they've immigrated, there's this literal physical separation from that history of like, you know, I can literally leave it behind, right, in the, the homeland. Um, but trauma affects not only the individual's health, but also how that individual lives their life and how they parent their children. Um, and so communication can be a major issue in families with traumatized parents, um, as the parents are often reluctant to discuss their past with their children. Um, they may communicate in ways that can pay fear, shame, and sadness around this sort of like unexplored past, or it, they might communicate in ways that induce guilt in the children for the hardships that their parents faced. Um, I think this was probably familiar to a lot of, um, you know, people with immigrant parents that they're like, wow, my parents have suffered through so much, right, to get me here. Um, and that's, I think, even more magnified when with parents who have this, you know, history of this, you know, severe trauma. Um, parents with trauma may also have difficulty meeting their children's emotional needs, um, particularly if they don't receive any support themselves for their trauma. So for example, parents may place their children in a role of the parent and rely on their children for emotional support instead of you know, being the parent who emotionally supports their child. The roles can become kind of reversed, um, which can you know, have you know, sort of impacts on how that child develops and how they learn to sort of relate to other people. 
Um, silence around the past also affects the family and can create a sense of loss for the second generation around this unknown history. So for children, not knowing about their family history can create a sense of incompleteness about their personal identities and even like around their um, ethnic identities. And so the bulk of research on intergenerational trauma um, has, or among Asian Americans has focused, as I said, on Southeast Asians. Um, other Asian American groups have generally not been studied using a framework of intergenerational trauma. And this might be just because um, a large number of Southeast Asians arrived in the US with the official designation of refugee, which is a legal recognition that they experienced you know, major trauma. Um, it is also a designation that casts them as a sort of, you know, like, quote unquote, needy population, which continues to limit the ways that Southeast Asians are perceived. In contrast, East and South Asians are held up as high achieving, low need, model minority immigrants. Um, but historical trauma is something that Asian Americans share. Um, the continent of Asia has suffered continual colonial um, violence um, and its consequences for centuries. Um, just in the 20th century, this includes, you know, World War II, the India-Pakistan partition, the Korean War, the Chinese Civil War and the Cultural Revolution, the Vietnam War, the U.S. bombings across Southeast Asia, the Cambodian genocide, and the Sri Lankan Civil War. So this means a lot of Asian American immigrants likely left their home countries after traumatic experiences of war, poverty, or political instability. Um, again, many of these histories are erased from mainstream US memory. For example, the Korean War is commonly known as the Forgotten War. Uh, many immigrants from Asia who may fit the definition of refugee were also not given refugee status. This all means that for many Asian American immigrant families, their trauma is not recognized and it might seem easier to, again, just forget the past and move on trying to live an American dream even though the trauma is still maybe affecting them. So we need more research that expands the framework of intergenerational trauma to uncover these stories and understand how these experiences impact Asian Americans' mental health and family relationships. Um, and I also think, again, that the framework of intergenerational trauma should continue to be expanded to other marginalized groups as well. Um, yes. Yeah, as someone pointed out, African-Americans, um, have experienced a lot of historical trauma, right? Based not only on slavery, but also just continual racial trauma um, over you know, centuries. And I think you know, research is also growing more in terms of Latinx immigrants, migrants, refugees as well, because a lot of the same issues that I just talked about, you know, that affected the continent of Asia also affected South and Central America. And a lot of it also has to do with US imperialism. Yeah, so I guess we can move on to the um, questions. Um, yeah, so like I said, you know, I covered some of the effects of um, intergenerational trauma in terms of mental health, like it can, you know, result in PTSD, which is, you know, post traumatic stress disorder, which is the kind of diagnosis that we usually associate with trauma. Um, but it can also, you know, have a lot of other complicated effects that can be kind of hard to study sometimes in terms of, you know, for example, the role reversal that I talked about between parents and children you know, those, those are gonna have really complex effects on um, the children. Some researchers have tried to sort of show that, you know, the PTSD can actually be transmitted from the parent to the child. Um, but I think a lot of times it's more sort of complicated than that, where, you know, being put in that sort of, you know, adult position of being the emotional support for your parents, you know, can contribute to a lot of other issues in terms of, you know, like depression, not being able to meet your own emotional needs, you know, feeling like you need to place other people's emotional needs before your own, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, similarly to how we, what we've talked about before, I think different people will respond to intergenerational trauma differently. Um, you know, some people are really, you know, they really want to know, right, about like, where do we come from? Where does our family come from? Some people kind of, you know, they get the sense that like, you know, well, my parents, my grandparents, they don't want to talk about that. So I'm not, I'm not going to ask about that because I don't want to upset them, right? Like, I don't want to, you know, bring up painful things, you know, they, they built, you know, work so hard to build a better life for us. I don't want to touch that. Um, and so that can sort of create this, you know, like gap, as I was saying, for people in their personal identities, for people in their relationships to their family, um, in whole communities, um, right? There is a professor at Boston College, Ramsey Leem, who has written 
wrote this whole paper about you know this project that he did with you know his Korean American community in Boston around trying to bring forth narratives about the Korean War to sort of like break this silence and sort of people can face that trauma um, in sort of a healthy way, right? That sort of transmits that history to the younger generations and allows people to recognize that publicly. I think people have um, mentioned how like public recognition of traumatic events, you know, is also really important. Um, and I think that, you know, for providers, um, I think it's probably not so much an issue of like asking about intergenerational trauma as much as it is like we've said before about like other things, you know, like thinking about stereotypes, thinking about racial trauma um, is just like sort of knowing that these things might be in play for that person or for their family, um, right? And how that might look for this particular individual. Um, so for example, right, like people have mentioned, you know, like what is this person's like family background you know for example if you're working with a black client right who you know their family has been in the us for many many generations right they probably have you know experienced a lot of these things and that might be affecting how they perceive things now um and sort of like what their families might be carrying you know and like sort of thinking about all how all these different things um interact. And I think that's why it's important to investigate intergenerational trauma for different communities, right? Because it's kind of kind of look different depending on the particular history, right? Like for <clears throat> Native American communities, right? This sort of this continual, like, you know, 500 years of like colonization and genocide is like constantly compounding. It might look different for different um, tribal communities, right? Like there's particular events that certain um, tribal communities might point to, like here, you know, um, the Dakota, you know, nation has you know, experienced things like the Wounded Knee Massacre, you know, the mass hanging um, of um, Dakota men. Um, those are, you know, sort of unique events that people can point to as like, these are sources of trauma, but there's also just the constant, you know, trying to destroy your culture, trying to destroy your identity, um, you know, the reservation system, allotment, like all these things. I think it might be kind of similar for Black Americans, right? There's you know, slavery, there's, you know, certain massacres that people might be able to point to, like, you know, this year is, you know, 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, um, but also just, you know, the constant racial trauma of being Black in America. And I think for Asian Americans, you know, the focus of sort of what I'm looking at in my research is the pre-migration trauma, like what happened in the home country before they migrated here. And that's because, again, Asian Americans are uh, majority immigrants. And so that's what that is gonna look like perhaps for people. Um, I think maybe now there's gonna be more research into the racial trauma um, that Asian Americans have experienced or like that's been highlighted by COVID-19. And so, yeah, I think it's important to think about how all these, um, you know, these unique histories take shape for different groups and for different individual families as well. But yeah, I think for time, we can probably move on to the next section. Great, okay, thank you. So the next theme is about identity formation and development. So we'll go ahead and start again with some poll questions. These should be accurate in which you can select multiple for the first one. So I'll give 60 seconds here. I know there's a lot of different answer choices to look through, so you can select the ones that stand out the most for you. But the first question is, what identities feel most salient, so important or noticeable for you lately? And then, do you feel your identities and sense of self impact your emotional and psychological wellness? So this will kind of be related to some of the different topics that we'll be talking about in this section. So we'd love to hear from you and what your experiences are. So about 20 more seconds here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. So 44% said that their age is most salient to them. And then after that is 34% saying that their socioeconomic status is most salient to them. And then 
Another 38% say that their racial identity is mostly linked to them. And then in terms of feeling that your identity is in sense of self impact your emotional and psychological wellness, 72% of us said absolutely for better or for worse. So I'll pass it on to Claire to talk more about identity formation and development. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about identity today because I feel like it's a topic that can't be left out when we're talking about minority mental health. So um, I think I mentioned a little bit in my intro, but I am interested in identity and how that affects a person's mental health and well-being um, and the sorts of experiences that a person might have to go through identity development and formation. So just to get on the same page, um, I wanted to talk about what identity is. And broadly speaking, identity is the memories, experiences, relationships, and values that create one's sense of self. So that's really important to hold on to, I think, the sense of self. And ethnic identity is the feeling of belonging to somebody's group and an understanding of what it means to be a part of that group, as well as positive attitudes towards the group, familiarity with its history and culture and involvement and its practices. So this is a pretty broad definition and it encompasses a lot of these things. But if you think about your own identities, um, you might have one or two or maybe all of these things, but not everyone might have all of these you know, feelings of belonging, a clear understanding, um, all of these things um, as part of their identity. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what identity formation is and how one's identity develops, especially in regards to ethnic identity. Right. So um, broadly speaking, identity formation happens with two different, um, two different things, and that's exploration and commitment. So those are the two different areas of identity. So exploration is defined as kind of the extent to which an individual actively seeks information about his or her or their ethnic group. Um, commitment, on the other hand, is considered the extent to which the individual has actually come to terms with the role of their ethnicity in their life and how that kind of manifests in their life. So these are the two different areas of identity formation, exploration and commitment. And based on exploration and commitment, there are these different stages of identity formation, as well as four different identity statuses that we'll just talk about briefly. So the reason that I'm covering this is not so that you can all memorize and try to place people in which identity formation or status they're in. It's just a helpful framework of thinking about how identity develops and um, kind of starting to consider how if somebody is in a different identity stage, um, identity formation stage or status, then you could maybe help them or you could work with them in a different way than if they were in maybe a more achieved identity status. So that's the role of this sort of slide. So let's um, talk about the stages of identity formation. So unexamined is basically exactly what it sounds like. This is when um, somebody has not actually explored their identity formation at all. And they haven't started to even think about what identity means to them. And so this would be that stage where they both haven't explored and they haven't committed. So they don't have that commitment to an identity either. Um, the moratorium or ethnic identity search status is where somebody starts to explore more, but they don't have that sense of commitment yet. And so this might be um, people learning more about their ethnic identity, starting to ask their parents questions about what the ethnicity means to them, um, trying to start practicing more of the cultural practices or foods. So for different people, the ethnic identity search might look very different. But this is the stage where you're doing that exploration, but you haven't actually committed yet. And achievement refers to the stage where you have explored and you've committed. So now you know what this ethnic identity means to you. And um, you kind of realize like what this identity um, will actually mean as you live your life. It affects your values, it affects your choices, that sort of thing. Um, one disclaimer that I just wanna have here is I'm using the term ethnic identity, but I wanna make sure that I note that this refers to all different identity formation. Um, 
And then moving on to the four identity statuses, this is pretty similar to the stages of identity formation. Um, so the developmental or diffuse status is when individuals have neither explored nor committed to an identity. The foreclosed status is characterized by committing to an identity, but not having actually undergone any sort of extensive exploration or search. So this is um, the sort of person. Um, so there was a qualitative study done about the different identity statuses. And during one of the interviews, somebody said, I don't go looking for my culture. I just go by what my parents say and do. And that's just the way things are. So that would refer to somebody who has that foreclosed sort of identity status. The moratorium, as I explained earlier, includes having explored an identity, but not having yet committed to it. And finally, an identity that's considered achieved is once an individual has gone through extensive periods of exploration and have committed to making that identity important to their self-construal. And so this might be somebody who says something like, oh, people put me down because I'm Asian, but I don't care and I can accept myself more and being Asian is important to me. So now as we look at these different identity statuses, I think it's just important to um, recognize once again that even though I'm presenting it in this very linear fashion, that's not how identity formation and how identity development works. And that's something that I'm interested in is the transition periods of a person's life. So when you enter college, when you get married, or when you start a new job, or, you know, there's all of these different life experiences when you become a parent is another big one. These transition periods in a person's life actually come with new identity formation as you start to figure out and um, include all the different parts of yourself, the identity that, you know, like in the poll question that you answered, we hold a lot of different identities. So you might have achieved that status of, you know, exploring your ethnic identity, but once you become a parent, you might have to figure out how does that ethnic identity come into my new identity of being a mom or a parent or a dad? And so that's something that I just wanted to highlight as well. So moving on to the next slide, why does all of this matter? So the research on identity is um, something that um, I wanted to just make sure we touched on because we all know kind of intrinsically that identity is important. I think the poll kind of showed that as well, right? Absolutely, um, for better or for worse, identity matters. Um, but research shows that there's actually um, a relation to many positive psychological outcomes. So some of the things that I have listed on here is less depressive symptoms, less anxiety, substance abuse, higher self-esteem, satisfaction with life, social connectedness, academic achievement for our adolescents and young adults. So identity and having that um, sense of achieved identity status is a really important part um, and a really important component to our psychological well-being. So next slide. One of the things that I wanted to talk about more specifically to Asian Americans as we're talking about Asian Americans today is the different factors that come into play in identity formation. And the two things that I have listed here are of course not comprehensive, but I wanted to make sure that we touched on the family's influence and then peers and friends. And then I, I'll talk about more broadly, the community, schools, that sort of thing. So identity formation, oftentimes, I would say virtually never happens in a bubble. So because of the messages that somebody receives, an individual receives throughout all of their life, all these messages are um, put together. And then all the exploration that that person does um, is put together to create that identity. And as you um, piece together all these different messages that you receive from media, from your family, from your friends, um, and then also as you do the exploration, those things are put together to create that identity that might become more salient for you. Um, so I think especially for Asian Americans, the role of the family is something that cannot be ignored. This is true for everyone, but as um, Jay was kind of talking about in that last section, as we were talking about um, in the first section as well, the first theme, we were talking about the role of the family and as many um, Asian Americans come from immigrant families, um, this is something that really plays a big role in identity formation. 
especially for immigrant children. So the descendants of immigrants, right? Um, they might be referred to as um, second generation um, Asian Americans. Um, these folks really need to go through a lot to develop in their identity. And there's many different reasons for this, but one of the things is their family is also trying to figure out their identity as well. So their parents, um, whether they have a history of intergenerational trauma or they're trying to figure out the process of acculturating to the United States or to immigrating, um, they're going to be trying to figuring, figure out like what it means for them um, to have an ethnic identity in this new setting. And so as their parents are trying to figure this out, it's going to be um, sometimes more difficult for the child or for um, the adolescent to figure this out on their own as well. And then there's the role of family and friends. With family and friends, um, sorry, with peers and friends, that they play a whole new role in um, sharing messages about what it means to be an Asian American or Korean American or Indian American, whatever it is. And these days we can't ignore the influence of social media either. And so all of these things are factors that we need to consider in identity formation. Um, so the other considerations that I have here are of course the generational status. So as, the, as Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group, um, there's going to be a lot more in future generations, um, Asian Americans who grew up in the US, who were born in the US. And so how does that affect somebody's identity formation? If um, other people view them as just Asian, but then they've only been in America and the US for all of their life, um, what does that look like for them to be able to balance those two things and put it together? And then I think another thing that I wanted to um, point out, I put biculturalism here, but really what I wanna talk about is intersectionality, I think. so. One person does not just hold on to one identity. Of course, there might be things that are more salient, but for different people, it might be their ethnic identity that's important to them, but it might also be their familial role or their role in the community. It might also be um, the role that they have um, in, their, in um, their gender orientation or sexual orientation. And so, you know, we have to really consider the intersectionality and how identity is a really complex and very dynamic process um, and the development of identity is something that you know really differs for each person. All right. So um, I want to be mindful of time, but I do want to talk about cultural humility. So we often talk about cultural competence, and I think cultural competence is important. You know, it refers to um, being able to be competent in your practice with all different cultures. And oftentimes people think of this as having a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill in working with people of all different um, cultures and all different backgrounds. But I think that's a lot for us to hold, um, especially as mental health care providers and as advocates. Um, the expectation that we are supposed to know everything about every single culture is, I think, unreasonable and actually harmful. So what happens is um, people are trained on cultural competence and they're told to read this resource about that group and read that resource about that group. Watch this video about Asian Americans and watch that video about Black Americans. And that's often the way that we think we're developing in cultural competence. But I want to um, kind of introduce this framework of cultural humility. Personally, for me, this has been very helpful in trying to kind of work through how I'm going to be somebody um, who can be an advocate to all different sorts of people. So with cultural humility, this is a process that requires an ongoing commitment to the client and the continual engagement in self-reflection and critical self-awareness. So exactly what the definition says there on the slide. Cultural humility is the awareness and the recognition that you're not going to know everything. And that's exactly what humility is, right? Knowing that you are not um, someone who's able to do it all and have it all. And so I think with cultural humility, it's really helpful for clients when you're able to admit, hey, I don't know everything, but I really want to learn. So it actually is 
Um, I think it says on the next slide, Denison, if you could um, move on to the next slide. Yeah, it's really um, about emphasizing accountability rather than just emphasizing knowledge acquisition. So you could be somebody who, you know, spends all their time reading articles and watching videos and trying to get trained um, on cultural issues and working with cultural clients. And I think that's really great and that that should be um, definitely praised. Um, but I think a bigger portion too, and the more important piece is being able to be accountable to what you're learning and being able to practice that um, with our clients, with our patients and our students. And so um, I think I'll leave it at that for cultural humility so that we have, um, we have some time for questions and discussion, but um, yeah. All right, so there's a lot of really good questions on here. Um, since we are running low on time, maybe if folks have specific questions that they would like answered, they could put that in the chat. Um, and then Jay and I can kind of focus on that one more. Anything? Do you want to just take one of the ones on the screen and? Sure, that sounds like a good plan. Um, maybe I'll tackle this first one. How can we learn about and ask about others' identities in a respective and supportive manner? Um, this is a big question, and uh, maybe after I answer, Jay, feel free to chime in and add anything. Um, but, you know, I think this is a really important question because I think sometimes people have a fear about asking about others' identities because they think that's taboo or they feel like that's not, um, I don't know, politically correct or something like that. But I think um, for this question, one of the things that I really want to emphasize and really want to remind everyone of is um, kind of the motivation behind the question and how you're asking that question. So I think it's really great that we want to learn and ask about others' identities, but it has to be in that respectful and supportive manner. One of the things that I think is important when doing something in a respective and supportive manner is to be transparent. And so oftentimes um, you might have heard about how asking the question, um, like, where are you from? Um, could be perceived as offensive or as a microaggression. And that's true of Asian Americans because for somebody who was born and raised in Ohio, for example, um, if you are expecting for them to say, oh, I was born in China or I'm from China, then that's the wrong question to ask. And so I think it's really important to be intentional about the sorts of questions that you're asking. And so that's that just means that you have to do some of this thinking ahead of time and at you know, discussions and webinars like this to kind of think about how you wanna phrase that question. So if you're curious about somebody's ethnicity, you should ask them, what's your ethnic background or what your, what's your ethnicity rather than asking them, where are you from, right? And so I think it's little changes like this in our language that actually helps us to be respectful and supportive of ethnic and racial minorities and having that attitude of wanting to learn and wanting to ask rather than, um, Kind of having them take the burden of figuring out what you're really trying to get to, right? And so I think that's another thing is um, when we're wanting to learn about and ask about others' identities, I think it's um, important to remember that there's actually a lot of resources open to you out there as well. And so to expect your one friend who is of that identity to explain everything to you, I think it would be really kind of that friend if they were happy to do that. But it's also your responsibility to do some of that learning and to do some of that teaching yourself before you go to that friend and are able to ask them about the different things that you want to learn about. And so I think some of these things are just 
you know, it's not hard and fast rules necessarily, but I think it's something that you want to just consider as you think about what it means to be respectful and what it means to be supportive. Jay, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think it is, um, yeah, about like sort of what is your intention behind seeking out this information, right? Like, I mean, I can share like my personal experience, right, of, um, you know, being in the position where I was experiencing the lack of cultural confidence from like a white provider. Um, and that was, you know, like, she would ask me a lot of questions, which I think were good in terms of like, you know, gathering information that she didn't have. But it became this sort of like weird dynamic where I felt like we were spending a lot of time in my, you know, therapy sessions with me answering her questions about like being Asian or something. And like that's sort of a lot like sort of what Claire was talking about before, you know, a lot of legwork that you can do on your own time and not, um, you know, yeah, like putting your client in that position, for example, of like being their resource um, for that information when there's like a lot of other ways to seek out that information. And I think, is it like, you know, and I think that's like something that we get told a lot, you know, in our clinical training is like, is what you're doing for the client or is it for you, right? Um, which I think is a, is a driving principle behind like a lot of different, you know, decisions that you might have to make, you know, not just what kind of questions you're asking, but like, you know, what are you telling the client and, you know, like how are you interacting with the client generally? So, yeah. For sure. Yeah, so um, Ashley said in the chat that she would like to hear responses to question three. Um, so the question is, how can providers that are of a different ethnic identity than their client practice cultural humility? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. And I think it's a hard one um, because, um, you know, cultural humility is not something that I would say comes naturally per se. <laughs> and so I think it's something that you need to do um, a lot of, you know, the legwork that we've been talking about, the work of reflecting and being self-aware and self-reflective before you ever even get into that space with that client. Um, I think one of the things that um, is a concrete maybe sort of technique or strategy that you can take in order to be culturally humble um, is when you're actually working with that client to have that non-assuming attitude that we talked about earlier, um, to be able to ask them um, questions that really get at what their experiences were and how they're ex experiencing whatever is going on in their life rather than making assumptions. Um, so yeah, I think that's one, one way that you can um, kind of start to practice cultural humility is first of all, by doing the work beforehand and then um, by being able to um, really try to come from that perspective of not assuming and being curious, so. All right. Let's see, um, the question, Question um, under question number two, the second bullet point says, what can contribute to someone reaching the achieved identity formation development stages and statuses? Um, and then I kind of want to combine that with question three as well. And how can um, providers kind of help, help aid in that, in reaching that achieved identity formation? Um, so I think one of the things that you can do, and I think there was a question about this actually in the Q&A section, is, um, is to just have some knowledge about different resources that you can um, kind of point clients towards um, so that if you can't do it alone to be able to say, hey, these are other resources that you could try out, um, I think could really help somebody who is trying to reach that achieved identity formation and that development stage. Um, so um, that's one thing that I would mention is just to concretely have kind of that list of good resources in your back pocket that you can pull out and refer um, clients and students to. Yeah, I think that also sort of gets to what we had mentioned before about like internalized racism, um, and, you know, like which just means the ways that people can internalize the racism that they experience and that is, you know, projected against people of their group. 
Um, and so I think combating that is an important part of like allowing people to do these, you know, processes of exploration, commitment and stuff like that to reach that sort of identity formation. Right. All right, excellent. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So if there is anything else on the screen that either of you want to discuss a little bit more, whether it's um, intersectionality or issues with identity formation and how that can negatively impact mental health wellness, anything that you would like to expand on. We have a few minutes um, for that. Otherwise, we can, we can wrap it up. Yeah, I don't think there's any question that I'm like specifically burning to answer, but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say I really appreciate the chance to come here and kind of discuss um, what we feel passionately about. Um, I, yeah, I will speak for myself. I'm sure Jay will be open to this as well, but um, yeah, our emails are on here. So um, if you are interested um, or have more questions that you weren't able to ask, today, then we would be more than happy to um, have that conversation with you. So we all, yeah, we encourage all of you to continue in kind of the things that we talked about. It's something that I am trying to grow in and I am trying to learn. So um, we're all doing it together. Yeah, thank you everyone for your engagement and your great questions. Um, this is really fun. And yeah, we'd definitely be open to um, more questions. Wonderful. Well, we'll go ahead and share some resources. So once you get this PDF of the slides, you'll be able to click on each of these links if you are curious and learning more. And I know that there's a question in the Q&A specifically for supporting um, Asians and Asian Americans who um, are low income. And so I'll add that to this slide as well, too. I also added um, Dr. Richley's research lab, which both Claire and J.E. are a part of. So if you're interested in kind of the more research aspects of things, he does really incredible work, too. So you can definitely check that out and stay updated on that. And then uh, a lot of people are expressing gratitude in the chat. I'm not seeing any other questions, just lots of um, lots of gratitude and thank yous from everyone. So we hope that you were able to uh, kind of gain the information that you identified in that first poll that you were hoping to learn from this webinar. Um, and then just an extra plug to add our crisis resource line to your phone or follow us on the socials. The recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is Women's Advocates. And you'll receive an email from us with um, the slides and then information on how to receive a certificate will be in the email, but I'll also put it in the chat now. And then we would really appreciate it if you have time, just a few minutes to um, fill out the post webinar survey. It should automatically populate when you close out of the webinar, but if not, I'll put it in the chat as well. It'll also be in that follow up email um, on how we can improve what you liked about the webinar. If you'd like to see more panels like these, we'd just love to hear from you on your experience with this webinar. Other than that, I think that is about it. So we'll go ahead and close out the webinar. Thank you all again so much for taking time out of your days, out of your Friday to learn about um, minority mental health, especially for um, Asian Americans. And so thank you again to our wonderful interpreters and to J.E. and Claire for being such informative and wonderful speakers. And so I, I really enjoyed it and learned a lot from both of you too. So I hope you had a positive experience with it. Yeah, thank you for organizing, Brennison. Yeah, thanks so much. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.